Hi, my name's Benji. Welcome to Dice vs Cards. Today, we're looking at Clank with an exclamation mark. A two to four player competitive deck building game where you need to pick cards to upgrade your deck to a more powerful, more winning version of the one you started with. It also has elements of point to point movement and push your luck because you need to move around the board as efficiently as you can and accommodate the variable hard timer that you'll experience as you play through. Now you play as burglars looking to delve the deeps of the Dragon Keep and uncover the most precious artifact you can before you awake the dragon. At which point she's pissed and you need to scarper out of there as quick as possible before you become Tuesday's dinner. Either raw or burnt, she doesn't discriminate. So let's see how this plays and whether this could be the next game for you. So the object of the game is for you to be the player with the most points when either all players have got in and out of the dungeon having recovered an artifact or when the dragon gets completely bored of you all and instantly knocks out everyone remaining in the dungeon. Now to set up the game you'll need to start placing tokens on their respective spaces on the board. So here we have minor secrets and major secrets that are placed face down however you place two minor secrets on that space. And then all of the artifact tokens are placed face up on their respective spaces and then you have miscellaneous tokens like these monkey idols that go on their respective spaces. You'll then need to take the dragon token and place it on the rage track dependent on the number of players playing. Each player will then need to take their own set of coloured clank cubes and their adventurer meeple and each player will also need to start with the same 10 card deck. You'll then set up the communal reserve and then you'll populate the dungeon row by drawing the top six cards of the dungeon deck and placing them in a communal marketplace for everyone. However, if you draw any cards with this dragon symbol here, you simply draw the next card and make sure that all of these don't have dragon symbols and shuffle the remaining back into the deck. Blah, 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 blah. Now you randomly decide who the first player is going to be and then that player will place three of their clank cubes into the clank area and then the second player will place two and the third player one and so on. Now you'll also need to bring this opaque bag that comes with the 24 black dragon cubes that are going to be drawn that represent the dragons attacking throughout the game. Once that's all done, you're then good to go. Each player on their turn is going to draw the top five cards from their deck and they're going to invariably generate resources for you to be able to take actions throughout your turn. So the main, three main types of resources are skill, these numbers with the blue background, and skill acts as currency for you to buy cards from the communal marketplace or from the communal reserve. Then this yellow boot represents the ability to move throughout the dungeon as you go. Then the last one, which you don't start with in your deck, are these red swords. Blah, 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 blah. Some will also have an automatic effect like this stumble card, which when drawn immediately means you're going to add one of your clank tokens to the clank area. Now this represents the noise that you're making throughout your journey and any time a dragon attacks increases the likelihood of you taking damage. Someone well, wants to use their fourth skill to buy some cards from the reserve or the marketplace. So they decide they want two of these mercenary cards. Now the cost for each card can be found in the bottom right hand corner. So two mercenaries are going to cost four skill. And any cards that are bought are immediately placed in the player's discount pile. Now they're also going to use their one movement point to move one space across these white lines. And there are some extra limitations. So for example, uh, a route with footprints on means that you need to spend two movement points to get from here to here and those with a padlock on them mean you need to have purchased a key from the marketplace later on in the game. Now once your turn ends you then discard all of the remaining cards in your hand and draw the next five. We've now skipped ahead a turn to illustrate that when you go to draw cards from your deck and there are none remaining, you need to then shuffle your discard pile and then draw the top five cards. So here we see player one has drawn the mercenary card this time, which will allow us to demonstrate how the swords will work. So 
if there is a monster in the communal marketplace, you can use a number of swords equal similarly with the skill to the number in the bottom right hand corner to defeat that monster. And when you do, you'll enable the text that can be found next to the defeat keyword. Now, there is always a goblin available for some slaying, and the goblin automatically gets you one gold every time you defeat it, and it will cost two swords every time you do so. And you can do that as many times as you want. This really is the goblin that keeps on giving. Now, any time you take cards from the communal marketplace, at the end of your turn, you then replace any empty spaces in the dungeon row. And you'll see cards like this Overlord also have an arrive keyword. And that means that when you draw them and place them in the dungeon row, they'll, have, they'll carry out the effect as described on the card. The ultimate goal is for you to take one of the face arm artifacts and then scarper out the dungeon as quick as possible. But before we talk about that in more detail, a couple more actions we need to discuss. First is that when your adventure is on a marketplace, or market space, they can spend seven gold to buy one of the following, either a crown that will give them points at the end of the game, a backpack that will give them less points, but also the ability to take more than one artifact out of the dungeon, or a key token that will allow you to take shortcuts through routes that have padlocks on them. Now at some point you're going to refill the dungeon row with a card that has this dragon symbol on. And what that denotes when you draw it is that the dragon attacks. Now no matter how many you draw when refilling the dungeon row, there will only be one dragon attack per player turn. Now when the dragon attack takes place, you're going to take all the clank cubes in the clank area and place them in the opaque bag with the dragon cubes. And then you're going to draw a number of cubes equal to the number seen on where the dragon is on the raid tracker. And then if it's black cubes, put them to the side as all of the adventurers have not taken any damage. However, if one of the player's cubes is drawn from the bag, that, let's just say player one, the yellow player takes a damage, that will then be placed on that player's damage meter here. And if at any point, enough damage is taken so that a cube is placed on the skull icon here, the game ends for that player. Now if that player has grabbed one artifact and managed to get above the depths denoted by this boundary here, they'll still get to count their score at the end. However, if they're still in the depths, unfortunately they're out and get no points. You'll see here a few turns later, player one has managed to escape the dungeon with a seven point artifact. And player two, the green player, is still languishing the depth, in the depths. However, they have got that 30 point artifact that they're hoping to get back to town with. So on the first turn that a player exits the dungeon, they'll place it on the tracker here accordingly. And then whenever it would have been that player's turn, they'll move their meeple one up this tracker. And you'll see here, each turn that player gets a go, the dragon will attack. And these plus symbols here denote the extra number of cubes that you draw from the bag every time you do. However, any time in this example, a yellow cube is drawn, that is effectively ignored and treated as a dragon, a dragon cube as well. So as you can see there, the clock is on for player two, the green player, to get at least above the depths to survive and count up their points at the end of the game. Now, if they're able to do that, they'll count up the artifacts they've got and any gold they've got throughout the game, because every gold is worth one point, and then any other treasures as well. However, unlike player one, who received 20 points and a mastery token when exiting the dungeon, anyone that gets out of the depths but doesn't exit back to town will not get those 20 points. So once the end game tracker is up to this last space that will immediately denote the end of the game and at that point that's when everyone gets to count up their points accumulated from any cards that have been bought and that have points in the top right hand corner any points on treasure tokens as I've just explained one point for every gold they have remaining and any artifact points that they get so that's how this plays what did I think of it
So who is this game for? Well, it's light to medium weight, and if you like your deck builders with a few bells and whistles, most notably here, this is a light dungeon crawler as well. Or if you like games with punctuation marks and subtitles, this has both of those. Now you might want to consider this if you liked Quest, The Quest for El Dorado, published by Ravensburger, or Tyrants of the Underdark, published by Gale Force 9, albeit that one had more emphasis on area control. So in terms of gameplay, well, it's an absolutely glorious combination, that being deck building with point-to-point -point movement on a board. They really do mesh and sing together. Think Lennon and McCartney, or Rocky Balboa on Uncooked Eggs. Jeez, that went downhill quickly. There really just is so much to offer in terms of variety. There are a myriad different ways for you to approach this game. You can go combat heavy and try and get through those monster routes or gain access to more golden points through the killing of monsters in the marketplace. Or you can tippy toe through and go full exploration and look to make as little noise as possible and get in and out of there with the most precious artifact you can. Now the fact that all of most of the tokens are face down and random really does add to replayability as well because you never know what you're going to get and the double sided board only helps with that value and that replayability. Now all this adds up to just an absolutely amazing gameplay experience but before you look at me and think god this is one big fanboy one slight negative would be in the push your, push your luck element. Now, mechanically and the way it's balanced, the artifacts and where they're placed on the board is never going to be perfectly balanced, but that's not my problem with it. My problem with it is that the onus is on the players themselves to create an appropriate game length. So whether it's the first gameplay through or not for you, you're always going to come across players like, I don't know, let's go on Timo. Well, Timo is going to look at that board and see the five uh, gold artifact and think, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get out as quick as possible. The other players, they're going to be stuck underground and the dragon's going to eat them, burn them, say la vie. But what happens is come the end of the game, Timo, who's not been playing for the last 20 minutes, is sitting on a mediocre 25 points. All the other players have at least got above ground and at least one of those players has beaten Timur's score. So what that means is all the other players have just not played the game they've wanted and everyone goes away unhappy. So in terms of the look and feel and theme of the game, well, again, everything has been done to a higher standard here. Component quality, yes, yeah, some of the cubes are a bit bland, but you know, the box art is attractive. The player ball does a good job of immersing you into the theme of the game even though the rule book's a little bit light on that. But if you take the time to read the flavor text on a lot of the cards, then that will only enhance the theme as well. So big shout out before I go to that goblin. Man, that guy takes some abuse and keeps coming back for more. But without any more nonsense and drivel, Dice versus Cards are gonna give a final score to this fan dabby dozy game of nine out of 10. I cannot say enough positives about this and I will be spreading the gospel of the clank. However, that's it from me. I'll see you next time.